This is going to be Philippians chapter 4 verses 10 through 23. So Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10 says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. First we see that Paul teaches us we should give men the benefit of the doubt. The Philippians had went a while without sending Paul any material things. But now their care for him has flourished again, as the verse says. And he doesn't accuse them of being greedy or not being careful for him. He just says, but ye lacked opportunity. So he's giving them the benefit of the doubt. Many times Christians will jump the gun and think that the worst of their brother or sister in Christ and many unnecessary fights and grudges happen because someone expected the worst worst of another and didn't give the benefit of the doubt many times a person wonders why they don't get a visit when they're sick or why don't someone shake their hand they will automatically expect the worst and break fellowship with that person over a small misunderstanding because they didn't want to give the benefit of the doubt many times a preacher or teacher could misspeak in a sermon People will get in a hurry to accuse him of being a liar or deceiver. Even in the Bible-believing crowd, sometimes men will accuse a NIV user of being a lost person. But we need to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they don't know the issue. Maybe they haven't had it showed to them how the new versions are wrong. Or someone may see a fellow Christian at Walmart going down the beer aisle. They automatically say, hey, he's getting alcohol. But really, he's probably just getting water bottles that are on the same aisle we need to give them the benefit of the doubt but paul is once again using his favorite word in this epistle which is the word rejoice he is rejoicing in the lord he would do this even if they hadn't sent him anything and if he is bitter at someone and not giving them the benefit of the doubt he probably wouldn't be rejoicing as much notice he doesn't he doesn't say it's about time you sent me something or something along those lines. He just says, but ye lacked opportunity. And then Philippians 4.18 says, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So the Philippians sent some things to Paul and it result, resulted in an odor of a sweet smell. It was well pleasing to God. Which brings an interesting thought to mind when you read this verse. Maybe when we get our glorified bodies, we will be able to smell a sweet smell when someone does a good deed for another. You hear about people talking about how we will be able to smell colors in our glorified bodies. Maybe the good deeds of fellow saints will be sweet smells to our nose and but next we see that we should appreciate what God has put on the table Philippians 4 11 through 12 says not that I speak in respect of want for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 8 says, And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And Paul says, In whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. So he was content with his food and his raiment. These verses are really hard to stomach. Uh, my flesh does not like these verses, and I have a harder time with verses like this than any verses in the Bible. And this is because the eyes of man are never satisfied, as it says in Proverbs 27, 20. And getting to a point where you are following a verse like Matthew 6, 20, getting to a point where you're following a verse like that every day is, is a hard place to reach. Matthew 6, 20 says, But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through, nor steal. Our eyes are never satisfied. We're always wanting more and more. And a lot of times we aren't content with the things that we have. If we are doing this, if we are laying up 
for ourselves treasures in heaven, then we don't have to worry about getting satisfied down here on earth. Colossians 3, 2 says to set your affection on things above. And if we could do that, then we would be content. In Luke 16, the rich man is begging for a drop of water on his tongue. If we realized we have water everywhere, everywhere we go, we're not thirsty, we have food, we have clothes, and we deserve to be in hell, we would be content. As long as you have food and water, you need to be content. Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head, but Jesus was content. He said, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Philippians 4.11 and 12 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. <clears throat> Notice it says, For I have learned, showing that Paul probably didn't have this attitude to start out with. He's learned to have this way of and this outlook on life. And then Philippians 4.12 says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So Paul is suffering a lot of things that many American Christians most likely aren't suffering. Sometimes he is full, and in this case, he is full because of what the Philippians have sent. Sometimes he's hungry. Sometimes people haven't sent him what they should have. Paul said he is in fastings often. So sometimes he's hungry willingly, and many times he probably just didn't have anything to eat. The only time I have suffered for food is when I did it willingly. I've never been without food. And when you are blessed, it can be harder to set your affection on things above and to be content. 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Hebrews 13.5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we need to be content with what God has put on the table. And next, we need to see that we can do all things through Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. If you're having a hard time with being content... If you think that's impossible, just remember, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The Bible correctors have a hard time with this verse. They think it should read, I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. They don't think you should refer to Jesus Christ by saying, which, W-H-I-C-H. -H. And that's when you say, you say to them, well, which one of us didn't know that? And see if they pick up on what you just said. But people speak this way every day. You say which, W-H-I-C-H, -H, when referring to a person all the time. And that is why I believe the verse in 1 Corinthians 13.10 that says, When that which is perfect is come, I, that's why I believe that is the Lord Jesus Christ. If he can be referred to using the word which, W-H-I-C-H, -H, in Philippians 4.13, he can be referred to with the same word in 1 Corinthians 13.10. But the verse says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. If you see this verse on a picture, it's most likely going to say, who strengthens me. But I stick with the King James, and I want to say what it says. My problem with the verse doesn't have to do with any of the words. It has to do with how hard it is to follow. This is a hard verse to follow. If I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, then I can do a whole bunch of stuff that my flesh doesn't want to do and things that the Bible tells me to do that I don't want to do. I can do those things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I notice the basketball players are putting Bible verses on their shoes now and one guy has this verse on his shoes the Philippians 4.13, but it only reads, reads, I can do all things. He leaves out the best part, which says, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And we shouldn't leave out that part. We should say the whole verse. I mean, you can say I can do all things, but without Christ, you can't do anything. But next we see we should help others in their affliction. Philippians 4.14 says, Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. 
And First Thessalonians 3, 7 says, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. So Christians can get a great deal of comfort in affliction when other Christians help them. And they get comfort in their affliction seeing other Christians doing what they're supposed to be doing in their affliction. The Philippians communicated with Paul's affliction. They gave him material things because he labored in the word and doctrine and fed them the words of God. And Paul did the same thing Moses did, which Moses in Hebrews 11.25, it says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Paul went through a lot of pain and suffering. He did this because he loved other Christians. He also had a love for lost people. Romans 9, 3 says, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That's what Paul said. He said he wishes himself accursed, basically, if people would get saved. He was willing to be accursed from Christ if his kinsmen, according to the flesh, would believe the gospel. And this shows he would go through even more affliction, pain, and suffering and this suffering being in hell fire, if all these people would believe the gospel. He would do all this, he would go through all this pain and suffering just for another man to believe and be saved. So the Philippians communicated with him in his affliction. And ver verse 15 gives the definition for communicating. It doesn't just mean talking back and back and forth but actually giving material things to someone else. Philippians 4, 15 and 16 says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sit once and again into my necessity. So you see, you get rewards on your account for giving. Philippians 4, 17 says, Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Paul wasn't even wanting them to give for his benefit. The giving would have been more for their benefit. The material things they gave to Paul would have been rusted, broken, worn out, or stolen eventually. The eternal things they set up for themselves in heaven would last forever. That's why he says, But I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. So you have a spiritual rewards card when you do things that are good down here, you are racking up points up there. And Philippians 1.18 again, it says, But I have all and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things that were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So the Philippians sent some things to Paul, and Epaphroditus gave them to Paul, and because they did this, God smelled an odor of a sweet smell, and it was a sacrifice acceptable, and it was well-pleasing to Him. And next we see God is going to supply all of our need. Especially if we are helping supply the need of others, like Paul did, or like the Philippians were doing Paul. It says in Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And if you look at Matthew 6, verses 26 through 31, it says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith all shall we be clothed? Don't worry about the food and the clothes and the things that you need, because God is going to give you those things. God is going to give you what you need, especially if you are helping others in need. God has always supplied all of my need. He has always gave me food and clothes. If all God ever gave me was salvation, then that's enough. When you realize you're a sinner that deserves hell, you don't deserve a good wife, you don't deserve a good home, you don't deserve food, then you will be content with your supply. 
You'll be content with what God has put on the table. You'll love your wife more. If you realize you don't deserve a wife, you'll love your kid more. If you realize you didn't deserve your kids. And lastly, we see that we should give God the glory. Philippians 4.20 says, Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Give God the glory for your supply. Give Him the glory when you're able to give to someone else in need. It is only because of Him that you were able to even communicate with someone in their affliction. Philippians 4.21 and 22 says, Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chief, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. We should salute each other because we are soldiers in the Lord's army. In 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And lastly, we need a daily grace. Philippians 4, 23 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. To the Philippians, written from Rome by Epaphroditus. So we were saved by grace, and we need a daily grace, a daily growth in grace. This is done through reading the words, believing the words, studying the words, and then applying the words to our life. I hope you've got something out of this lesson and that you will apply these instructions to your life.